I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to the Bigfoot Project. Wild Man Calls Cabin Owner, Wayne County, Pennsylvania. We thought we should tell someone about the unusual occurrences at our cabin property in the Poconos, north of Holly. We inherited the property from my husband's parents when they passed within weeks of each other. They had told us about a wild man my father-in-law called Pocono Buck, but we hardly believed any of it until we took possession of the cabin and stayed there for ourselves in 2006. Pops described Buck like a hair-covered wild person, but broader through the chest and shoulders. His arms had no hair, and he told us that hair went mostly down Buck's backside. That is all we knew. Buck did not show himself to us, but we hoped. There has been whistling in the night. I should say that we are the only cabin on this side of the mountain, so we didn't know what was whistling unless it was Buck. My father-in-law apparently fed Buck for years, but we didn't know what he left out for the creature. What do you feed a wild man? We tried a lot of different vegetables and fruit, but he never took any of it. Then, in the summer of 2007, We were sitting on the porch one evening, watching the sky, stars, and so forth. The crickets were chirping and the frogs were croaking. A really beautiful night. Just as we were about to turn in, we got up and headed toward the screen door. There was a very loud, baritone voice that called, Abram! We were shocked. In the darkness, we never saw what called for Abraham, but we think it was Buck. By the way, Abraham was my father-in-law's name. Spooky, I know. He had been dead a year by that time, but must have missed my husband's father, as we did, of course. It is now 2008, and we are here again in the Poconos. With a bit of success, we found our advice to feed apples and corn worked. He does take them, and he does take pears. Where we put out the apples, bites were taken out, but not eaten whole, and Buck consistently left two twigs in the shape of an X, and one time a T. The bites are large mouth size not raccoon size. We don't know the meaning, but the last time he only took one ear of corn and left nothing in the way of stick sign. For several days nothing was taken, and then we left Buck some summer squash. He showed up and took all four of them. He does not show himself to us, and he does not call for Abraham anymore. He only did that once, and we both heard it. You couldn't mistake it. His whistles always come around two in the morning. We will keep you posted. Mitzi, Pennsylvania, 2008. In 2010, I received an update on this situation in the Poconos. The Sasquatch buck has not been seen since 2009. The Tim Peeler Encounter. Many of us will not forget Kassar, North Carolina resident Tim Peeler's 2010 encounter with a Sasquatch standing over his chained up dog. Peeler is the fellow who rough-talked and poked at the hairy beast with his walking stick. The walking stick, of course, was to become known as a get stick. Mr. Peeler rough-talked the Sasquatch, poked at it while urging it up the trail, shouting, Get! Get! Go on! Get now! Go on! Peeler was insistent in his effort to get the ten-foot giant to leave his terrified dogs alone. In retrospect, during a hard-to-get interview in late August 2011, Tim Peeler said he didn't like to talk about that day anymore. But he noted, the mercantile stores in Kassar churned out old knobby t-shirts by the dozens and get sticks like the one Tim Peeler used to ward off the ten-foot behemoth that messed with his dog. I don't have any first-hand accounts where a witness actually saw a Bigfoot eating dogs, but the interest in Peeler's chained-up dog was certainly a unique Bigfoot behavior, that it came brazenly right up to the Peeler homestead in broad daylight and checked out his dogs. Kassar is in Cleveland County, North Carolina. It was those authorities Peeler notified, saying, It looked like a giant ape with a man's face, and I was afraid to kill it. Sasquatch sightings are widespread throughout that region, some of them documented by law enforcement, including Mr. Peeler's account. Peeler's Bigfoot may have been sizing up his dog as an easy meal ticket. It reminded me of a similar story that was written up after a shaggy-haired Bigfoot was seen carrying a dog away under its arm in Louisiana, Pike County, Missouri. Little notice is given Missouri, but the state has a very long history of hair-covered giants, some of them brazen and unafraid of the local citizenry. It is said that the eastern Bigfoot, in particular the Missouri Momo, is less intimidated by humans 
and often makes no effort to conceal itself. The description of the Momo is generally the same as those seen in the Pacific Northwest. Mr. Peeler's use of the get stick to shoo and poke at the Bigfoot to get him to move away from the dog in daylight hours was noteworthy behavior, and not at all the behavior we've come to expect of the Bigfoot. It has been long held by research that the hairy giants generally move about after dark and sleep part of the daylight hours. This is no longer the case. It occurred to me some years ago that the Sasquatch probably rest or sleep when they feel the need, night or day. Reports of the Sasquatch being active during the daylight hours are many, but there are just as many case testimonials of them moving about in the dark of night. It is also held that they bed down at night, some making nests to sleep in, while others have been observed sleeping on the hard ground with no bedding, around logging piles of stripped lumber, and another old report of one sleeping out in the open on a sandbar, which is most unbelievable, but not if you understand the location was nearly four to five miles into deep forest where people never go. A favorite sleeping place is under or nearby stacks of logs, awaiting removal by logging machinery. I'm not sure why that would be the case, but I heard that first from De Hinden and in various places since his untimely death. Dogs Disemboweled Animals, Fort Bragg, Mendocino County, California. The witness heard a crashing sound coming toward his tent one night, close enough that he became seriously alarmed. The man's two dogs were in hot pursuit of something huge running through the woods, snapping and crashing its way through the underbrush. The fellow wrote, I suspected that whatever was moving that quickly and violently through the woods was trying to elude the dogs. I think this whole event lasted about 30 seconds, and then the crashing stopped. It was then the next scariest thing happened. The dogs barked a few more times, and then made that sound dogs make when they are hurt or injured. After that, I did not hear a single thing except the loud white noise that fear made inside my head. I never saw my dogs again. The last strange thing I would like to share with you during the last 22 years of my life, and that is... Twelve miles east of Fort Bragg, California, in the woods, is the frequent discovery of disemboweled animals, simply that, disemboweled. The rest of the animal intact. It's strange, but we've discovered several. J.S. Mendocino, California Sasquatch stays out in the open. Mendocino County, California, has had a very long history of casual sightings of Sasquatch people. Ty Mayer's sighting in June of 1998 on Masonite Road is another incident where the Sasquatch did not duck for cover. If we read deeper into the data, many sightings occur where they do not run for cover, but instead hang around momentarily out in the open, observing us. It is an unusual behavior when we stop to think they prefer being concealed. Mr. Mayer wrote, This happened near a wooded area not far from Ukiah, California. Ukiah is located in Mendocino County, north of Santa Rosa, between Willits and Heldsburg, along U.S. Highway 101, on the banks of the Russian River near Clear Lake and the Pacific Ocean. The creature was hair-covered and somewhere around eight feet tall. Its color was brownish-gray. It didn't seem at all threatening, but he did smell similar to that of a goat. It made no vocal noises and didn't seem afraid. The Bigfoot stayed within 30 feet of us, just staring in our direction. It, or he, stayed until it apparently lost interest in me, and then it walked back into the trees. It made changing my tire memorable. Ty Mayer, 1999. Sasquatch Killing, Fighting Dogs Browsing through the late Ramona Clark Hibner's data, I see she had a Florida witness who stated she saw a Bigfoot fighting with dogs, May 1977. Most of these brief reports give the impression that Bigfoot is intolerant of dogs. There was a single case file of a seven-foot Sasquatch that killed a bulldog, allegedly with one blow. It was cited in John Green's 1978 book, Sasquatch, the Apes Among Us. It occurred in Colfax, Washington in October of 1891, another very old report, but worth mentioning. In 1926, the McCurtain County, Oklahoma Sunday Gazette of July 9, 1978, page 16, recorded a statement by two hunters who saw a man-like beast kill their dog near the Mountain Fork River. 
Then, in 1947, several Pine Ridge Christian County, Missouri hunters reported a Bigfoot killed some of their stock, sheep and goats. When they hunted the beast, it killed their dogs and overthrew the hunter's jeep. But again, these are very old reports and nothing like that is currently being registered, at least not in my data. Still, the history of the Sasquatch and its association with dogs is reportedly both good and bad. Dogs. Three whatever was in the woods stories. First story. Dogs and it whistles like a meadowlark. A typist for the county, Mrs. Morgan, was walking her two dogs up a trailhead in Stevens State Forest, Lucas County, Iowa. Her two Dobermans began barking in earnest at a dark part of the white pine forest. Concerned that a cougar was prowling about, Mrs. Morgan turned to head the dogs back down the trail in fear that the dogs would tangle with a big cat. Then Mrs. Morgan explained that something strange occurred. She said whatever it was in the woods whistled a whistle that sounded like a meadowlark bird, only louder, and it went on for several seconds, then stopped. The dogs went crazy and pulled hard on the leash. It was difficult to keep control of them. They kept looking toward a very dark part of the trees. Then she described a return whistle, also sounding like a meadowlark, coming from the opposite side of the path. This is when she began to panic. The dog stopped barking and cowered at her legs, whining. Mrs. Morgan turned and ran back down the pathway to the parking area. The event left her drained and in fear of whatever was in the woods that caused her dogs to act like that, insisting those whistles were too deep to be from a meadowlark, and her Dobermans had never barked at meadowlarks before. The Maggie Mae Morgan Story Sasquatch Frustration with Hound Dogs on Scent Second, Whatever Was in the Woods Story In a letter from longtime Bigfoot enthusiast Fred Bradshaw, dated Tuesday, March 6, 2001, was another story regarding incidents with dogs. I interviewed two bear hunters in the fall of 1987 that used several hound dogs that would easily track and tree bear. And yes, Bobby, these dogs actually would track a Sasquatch this one time in the Capitol Forest. Alan Smith of Malone, Grays Harbor, Washington, was hunting with a second hunter. They live a mile apart from each other there in Malone. This one trip Smith told me about, he had kenneled five hounds in the back of his truck for a bear hunt. Let loose, the dogs lost no time catching scent and ran after it. In a few minutes, if you know hound hunting, the hounds sounded just like they did on any bear hunt when they got its scent or treed the animal. The dogs were in the woods about a hundred yards from Smith's truck, sounding as if they'd treed this bear. But quickly, Smith and the second hunter heard the hounds cry out like something hurt them. They yelped horribly. The men became alarmed when the two dogs came back and jumped into his truck. One was hurt. All went quiet as Alan and the other hunter, I forget his name, Bill I think it was, walked into the woods headed toward where they last heard the dogs on scent, yelping and howling. Hounds howl like instead of bark. Approaching the scene cautiously, they found one dog dead and another dog so badly messed up that he had to be put down. Searching with rifles cocked now, they came upon a very large barefoot track shaped similarly to a man's, only larger. There was a trail of these tracks on the ground. The air smelled foul. Smith found hair of something he couldn't identify. It was black to brown in color. Back at the truck, caring for the hounds and grieving for the lost ones, they decided to return the next day to continue tracking whatever killed his hound dogs. The next morning, Smith buried his dogs and found more of these large human-like prints. This time, he had only one dog with him, and it pulled at its leash headed forward at whatever did the damage, but Smith kept him on leash. He found more large footprints that were measured bigger than any man he knew, the shoeless tracks were all around the area of the woods where the dead dogs were found the day before, but whatever made the tracks wandered off into deeper woods where forest litter ended the search for the killer. The late Fred Bradshaw, a.k.a. Tracker 3. More dogs, third and last, whatever was in the woods story. George Wise was hunting up Pete's Creek Trail on a decrepit logging road near Donkey Creek in the fall of 1986. That would be the Winucci River area in Grays Harbor County, Washington. 
Mr. Wise had two very expensive dogs that were seasoned bear trackers with him that day. The dogs, nose to the ground, trailed off down the old logging road as fast as they could run and still gather scent. Wise followed and could hear them barking quite a ways off. Soon, only one of his dogs returned and wouldn't leave his side. Wise took off to look for the other canine. He located him a quarter mile down the road. He was dead. Wise was shocked and in disbelief it happened so fast. He wasn't prepared for anything like this. Approximately 200 feet further on down the same road, he saw two people walking and looking back over their shoulder at him. Wise hurried along, trying to catch up with the couple in an effort to find out if or why they killed his dog. Wise got about 80 feet from the couple, and as they turned slightly, he realized these were not ordinary people, but strange-looking things with dark hair all over their bodies. They were not clothed. Why stopped and stood there watching the things walk on, upright like him, not bear-like at all, and off the road into the woods. From the woods, he heard whistling. George Wise. Thoughts about Sasquatch eyes. I recently had to have my reading glasses upgraded to a thicker Coke bottle type lens, and in the course of that exam, my optometrist looked deeply into the iris of my eyes, with his pinched nose glasses and handheld spotlight. After studying the mechanics of my eyes, he remarked, So that's what a Sasquatch looks like. We both laughed. After 30 minutes of lecturing me about how my eyes have suffered the ravages of time from years of close computer work, he handed me a newspaper article he'd been saving for that visit. The tattered 2005 article was about an encounter with a Sasquatch on Highway 199 in Del Norte County, Northern California. Its headline read, Trucker Sees Bigfoot. 42-year-old Travis Cover from Brookings, Oregon, told an Oregon Curry Coast pilot reporter that he was driving his truck around 5 a.m. in the morning. It was still dark outside when he reached down for his lunch. When Cover looked back up, there before his eyes stood a big hairy monster standing next to a yellow road sign. It raised its arm to block the beam from my headlights. I've never seen anything like it. My optometrist kept the article because he thought it would interest me, and it did. He believed the behavior of the Sasquatch protecting his eyes was nothing short of human behavior. He further suggested that the eyes of the Sasquatch were probably much like ours, with all the same strengths and weaknesses when it comes to the glare of bright headlights. Much has been speculated in Bigfoot research about eye glow, the color and glare of their eyes. Little has been discussed about eye sensitivity to light, but I know I shield my eyes from bright lights. As humans, we can appreciate the reaction of the Bigfoot. It was a departure from the optometrist previously held thought that the Sasquatch may have specialized predator vision. If these giants are human and have a degree of specialized vision, that is, some uncomplicated deviation from our human eye that makes moving around and hunting at night easier than what we are equipped to do, then perhaps, like all things living wild, it's more about adaptation than it is any specialization of the eye's anatomy. Familiarization and adaptations make us different, yet the same in many respects. Shielding its eyes, its breasts showed. In 1993, a resident of Miller County, Missouri, in the region of Lake of the Ozarks, not far from Osage Beach, reported, I got a fairly good look at the creature as it crossed the road in front of me. When I hit my high beams, it stopped like a deer frozen in the headlights. It threw its left arm up in front of its face as to shield its eyes from the bright lights. That is when I noticed the breasts and hairy armpit. It was a female. It was covered with long reddish-brown hair that looked matted, like a wet shaggy dog is the only way I can describe it. Her face had the visage of a woman of the age, say, 35-ish. I can only guess the height, but it didn't seem that tall, maybe five to six feet tall. I noticed not only the non-hairy breasts, but the arm that was up shielding its eyes had no hair on the underarm or palm. I could see its skin that it was light in color, not dark like a chimpanzee. I guessed that it was a female because its breasts and linebacker butt. I wasn't the only one to see it. Other cars were pulling over and slowing down to look at her. This one car put down his driver's side window and yelled at it, then pulling up alongside me said something like, Get a load of that, will ya? 
That guy didn't know what he was looking at. To avoid ridicule, I only told relatives. A. Lovegren George Good of Poconos County, West Virginia, also mentioned seeing a Sasquatch shield its eyes when he wrote me in 2003. I quickly got another charged light, and you could see that it was humanoid with dark brown to black hair on its arms and body. It raised its arm to shield its eyes, and then, in just a flash, it ran over a football-length field and out of sight. This thing was enormous. When it ran off, it used both limbs to run. George Good. The entire length of Mr. Good's letter is listed in the Favorite Stories chapter. His remarks will intrigue. In October of 2011, John Nichols in Vancouver, Washington, graciously passed along an original copy of Roger Patterson's 1966 book, Do Abominable Snowmen of America Really Exist? I noticed on pages 167 to 9, Patterson investigated a local Yakima report that included shielding of the eyes and the behavior of peering into the driver's side window at the occupant. While we might think these unimportant behaviors, they are indicative of human behavior, curiosity, and the Sasquatch's often reported ability to run easily alongside vehicles in transit. Again, we see another mention of human sensitivity to bright lights at night. Here's what Patterson filed. When I returned from my latest pre-expedition, much to my surprise, I received a phone call which related an amazing story of a high school boy here in my hometown who had come face to face with a gigantic creature west of Yakima. I checked his story thoroughly by interviewing the boy and his father and mother, and it seemed to me an outstanding straightforward account. Ken Pettyjohn was returning home late at night September 19, 1966. As he rounded a bend in the road, his light shone on what he thought was a huge man covered with silvery white hair standing in the middle of the road. There was a drizzling rain falling, and when Ken saw this creature, he slammed on his brakes and stopped about three feet short of the figure. The creature held up his arm over his eyes to shield them from the bright lights. In the meantime, Ken's car engine stopped because of the suddenness of which he applied his brakes. The creature then walked around the back of the car and then around to the window where Ken was sitting desperately trying to start his engine. The creature stooped down and peered in at Ken. The sensation Ken felt was one of horror, and he was greatly relieved when the engine started and he could get away from there. He could see the creature's silhouette as lightning lit up the sky when he looked in his rearview mirror as he drove away. His description of the giant coincided completely with those of previous sightings, even though he did not know of this book or other sightings. I feel that in Ken Pettyjohn stepping forward and telling his bold story, it may help bring out the other stories of incidents by people who have had similar experiences. To end the reports about shielding of the eyes, longtime enthusiast Cliff Coppice briefly mentioned facial shielding in his article, Sasquatch, Fact or Myth, published in the 1963 British Columbia Digest. The Bella Coola Indians had a dance called the Box Dance, which portrayed the Sasquatch shielding his face from the squirting of the seawater from the clams. The terms Bok and Snainake are the descriptive words used by the Bella Coola and a number of other Pacific Northwest Indians in coastal northern British Columbia, Canada, Washington, Oregon, and California. In some areas, the term Bok is used interchangeably with the term Sasquatch. From native descriptions, the Bok resembles man more than the Salish Sasquatch. The Bok is said to have somewhat of a neck. The feet, hands, and the region around the eyes seem, according to various accounts, distinctly human. Wayne Suttles The Bushman walks upright like the Indian, but with a slight lean forward to the upper torso. It has a huge barrel chest and massive shoulders from which its arms seem to simply dangle from the sockets. The natives associate the hair on the torso in the same manner as the grizzly bear's hair, and in places as thick. Other bushmen are so sparsely haired as to not tell the difference between them and civilized man. A few First Nation people believe the bok is a spirit animal, but wolves, wapiti, eagles, killer whales, the bison, and the buffalo are spirit animals too. Do we think them any less real? Speaking of box, several sightings were featured on BCTV's 6 o'clock news November 13, 2002. 
The television anchor stated that there have been several sightings of Sasquatch-like beings by people traveling on the highway between Port Alberni and Tofino, and also near Long Beach on Vancouver Island. A long hair-covered creature with yellowish-orange eyes walking on two legs was seen by two Vancouver Island men. Two brothers named Ito, visiting from Japan, were hitching a ride on a freight train into Port Alberni when they spotted a large creature below the Rogers Creek trestle. Ken Christian. In a separate report, two Nuxalt anglers, while fishing about 30 yards offshore, said they saw two box either playing or after something that was on the rocky shoreline in the same general area of Long Beach. Neither man wanted to give their names, but the report came in separately and before the BCTV Evening News made it public. The men described the box as large-shouldered, shiny black in color and covered with thick hair, but not as long as the bears of that region on the mainland side, and said, You know, they look like all box look, covered with a length of hair. They said one of the creatures was keeping an eye on them, while the others scrambled about the rocks after something they couldn't make out. Both creatures were wet in appearance and made no effort to leave, but stayed out in the open going about whatever box do. After watching the activity for some minutes, the informants reportedly left the area out of respect for the box, but were too astonished to do any more fishing and returned home. A granddaughter, Alyssa, emailed me about the incident, saying that her pops was quite surprised to have seen the creatures. We are beginning a time in research where more reports are coming in about the Sasquatch staying out in the open, giving informants more observable time to note various behaviors.